12.30 on RTE1. The All-Ireland School Choir Competition in association with Cooperation Ireland is back. 20 secondary school choirs will battle it out in four regional finals. The winners from each final will get the chance to sing on the grand staircase of the Titanic Centre in Belfast in the hope of becoming Ireland's number one choir. Join us in our search for the All-Ireland School Choir of 2013. Begins Sunday at 5.20 on RTE1. We go back to the beginning and the day that Lenny met Penny. The Big Bang Theory soon on RTE2. A force of nature is about to be unleashed on Northern Ireland as Hector hits the road and makes a break for the border next Thursday night at 10.15. But now on One Nationwide takes a look under the bonnet of a very particular form of millinery. Nationwide this evening, the links between Ireland and Australia are explored as we hear the story of the Irish women who had to leave our shores during the 1800s. The women who became known as the Mothers of Australia are being remembered in a unique project here and down under. Good evening and welcome to Nationwide, coming from Kilmainham Jail in Dublin. This evening we're featuring an extraordinary woman who has spent the last six years of her life remembering each and every one of the 25,000 women and children who were transported from these isles in the 18th and 19th centuries. Her name is Christina Henri, she comes from Hobart in Tasmania and her project is called Roses from the Heart. Well, these are some of the 20,000 bonnets made so far by women throughout the world who felt a connection with the idea of remembering the children and women who were removed from Irish society. Now, over the last year or so, school children have been helping Christina to complete the project. And Niall Martin now reports on one school group from St. Patrick's in Downpatrick who lent a helping hand. This is the Down Museum in Downpatrick, County Down, and this heritage site at one stage in the 17 and 1800s housed 70 women who were transported to Australia. And it's so exciting for me because today we're going to have students from the schools in this district in Downpatrick helping to make bonnets for the babies and children of those women who were transported along with them to Australia. Well, this is fantastic. I'm so glad that you're all here today. I want to know how old you are. Would you be about 10, 11, 10? Any 12-year-olds? No. 11-year-olds? No. Not even 11. Well, I have to tell you that I'm here because I'm working on bonnets that are symbolic of every single convict woman who was sent out from England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales to Australia. Now the thing is we talk about convict women but they were actually 11 years old and older. So very close to some of your ages. And there were also convict men who were sent out and the boys of the convict men were as young as nine. So the bonnets are really important because in the 1700s and 1800s, all women wore bonnets. Every single woman wore a bonnet and all of the babies and children wore bonnets. And it was very important for them to be wearing bonnets, especially in Australia, because we have really, really hot weather there in Australia. So whatever you want to do, you can draw, you can sew, you can glue and you've got all the different materials on the table. There's ribbons and we've got all these wonderful helpers and teachers here today to help you cut or thread needles and help you with the sewing. And this is really old lace 
and a lot of the women when they were sent out they were lace makers and some of the women were sent out because they'd stolen pieces of lace. So I think it's lovely that we're putting lace on these little bonnets. Almost 70 women found themselves here in Downpatrick Jail before being transported to Australia. The jail is now the county museum and you can see the cells where the women were held, sometimes for petty crimes. This is one of the cells here in the cell block in the old jail of Down. I mean, transportation when it started was regarded by people in the late 18th century as a really good way of solving all kinds of problems. Um, obviously transportation had a longer history than that, but when transportation to Australia starts, it is looked on with favour by those who are the victims of crime. So the idea was if you were a victim of crime, the person who robbed you, say, would be re you know, removed from the countryside and you wouldn't have to look at them again, they wouldn't steal anything from you again. Those who were interested in reforming people, um, the Quaker reformers for instance, they viewed it with great favour because it removed you from the scene of your crime, from your old corrupt life to a new life and you had the chance to start over again when you'd served a sentence in Australia. Um, landlords, ratepayers, of course, loved it because it was cheaper than having to build new jails. Um, so it was looked on with favour by all kinds of people. Now, of course, prisoners weren't asked their opinion. They, their opinion wasn't, wasn't asked. And, of course, the population in Australia, the native population, they weren't asked what they felt about it. But for those who were interested in, in how society could be reformed and how crime could be solved, it offered a lot of potential. Back in class and the children are working hard on their bonnets. Then the children ask Christina questions about the Roses from the Heart project. Do you enjoy making the bonnets? I really do enjoy making the bonnets. When I first started making the bonnets, I had so much empathy for the woman I was making the bonnet for or her little baby, especially because I've had children, so I, I know how amazing it is to have your own child. How many bonnets have you made yourself? Well, it'd be a bit embarrassing if I said I hadn't made any, wouldn't it? But I have. I've made 90 bonnets. Now, I've made three bonnets because I found out in 2009 and 2010 that I have three female convict ancestors. So I've made three bonnets for my own ancestors and then the rest of the bonnets I've made for other women. The bonnets made by the children in Downpatrick today are going to be displayed as part of Christina's giant exhibition at Kilmainham Jail. Really it's been a Herculean task getting these bonnets made and look, this bonnet here commemorates the story of Mary Phillips who was transported to Van Diemen's land at the age of 21. And another one here, the story of Jane Poole who travelled on the Charlotte in 1788. And you can get the templates for these bonnets on the Roses from the Heart website. But the stories behind these women have struck a chord with many women, including a group just a few miles down the road. In a small room in the Doka Centre Women's Prison, prisoners are making some of Christina's bonnets. Under prison rules, we can't show prisoners' faces. Inmates at Arbour Hill and here at the Doka Centre have been part of a huge volunteer effort across the world to get 25,500 bonnets made. I'm only 2,000 bonnets off it being finished and then it will become an installation of 25,566 bonnets that represent the size of a woman's head. So it's like you'll be looking out on that number of people and that's the number that was sent out. It's extraordinary really when you think about it. I really enjoyed making the bonnets and it's really opened my eyes here. Just some of the bonnets there that Christine brought in there today and my God, there's some of them only babies. It's unreal. And she was saying they're done all over the world and whoever is doing them all over the world, fair play team, keep going and we'll keep going as long as I'm here. But Christina has a secret she's been carrying throughout her Irish visit that she wants to share with the prisoners in the room. Well, when I walk through the doors here, it's not an unfamiliar situation for me because I spent six months in jail. In there? In Tasmania. And I went to jail because I stole money. And it was the most horrendous thing that could happen to me in my life. I 
I was absolutely devastated. I was devastated that I was doing what I was doing and I was actually in my car. I'd, I'd planned what I was going to do. I was in my car. I tucked my three children up in bed and I was on the way to the bridge to jump off it. And, um, and as I was driving to the bridge, um, it's a tall bridge over the Derwent River in Hobart, I drove past um, one of the people who employed me, their house, who I had stolen some money from. And I stopped and I drove down the driveway and I, I, I said what I was doing and why I was doing it. And that was the beginning of the story of my being sentenced to jail and going to jail for six months and having to leave my children in someone else's care and not be able to be with them when things were going wrong. They couldn't come and see me when I would have wanted to have seen them. And the whole complete feeling of isolation that one has that society doesn't always know about because so many people in society haven't experienced what it's like to be in jail and to actually be not free. Christina got a second chance and she grasped it by taking a degree in art, getting her PhD and becoming an artist. And she wonders how the women in this room intend to deal with life after prison. I'm going to go to a cool mine. It's a stabilisation programme. And you go from 11 to 3 in the day and I'll be doing that. And I'll be working at a place called CAP, Care After Prison. Um, Sounds great. Yeah, I'll be working with them as well, and they're going to get me onto a hairdressing course out in Tala. So I just want to make a go of things now when I get out. I have three kids, so I want to do it for them. They're in voluntary care at the minute. So I just, I'm just doing it for my kids. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? You're saying you get a second chance, and I do believe in second chances, and people change. I've been on drugs for 21 years and through my drug use, I never really had anything to live for and I can relate a lot to you, Christian. I have three young children at the moment, five, six and seven. And through my drug taking, they ended up in the care of the HSE. Um, I have my little boy back, the seven-year-old, since three years now. And I'm in the process of my two little girls coming home full time. Christmas, if not Christmas, will be very soon after. But my relationship ended, you know, I had the car, I had the house, I had a whole lot, you know, but it wasn't enough for me. And um, through coming into prison, I've actually rehabilitated myself. Um, I'm using the education to my full advantage. I've done the hairdressing course, I've done the beauty. I'm actually getting involved now in the bonnets because I've heard the history behind the convict women prisoners. I have the proper people around me now. I just couldn't swallow my pride, you know, a long time ago. It was always there. I just wouldn't swallow my pride and ask for it. And now that I've done that, I'm making amends with my family and I'm starting to bond back with my children also. And my parent has me rocked through the whole lot. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to say thanks very much and it was a great pleasure working with you. And it was a big eye-opener for me because i never done history and I think it's a lovely story to the whole lot. So thank you very much. Thank you. After the break, we'll be telling the tragic story of some of the transportees who drowned even before they got to Australia. Don't go away. With 28 stores nationwide, call in for a free valuation of your gold or silver in any condition. Visit our website, hattingoldsmiths.ie, to locate a branch near you. Hattons, your local goldsmiths. It's paying attention to the little things that will keep us safe. So when you're at the bus stop, form an orderly queue. Always stand back from the edge of the pavement. That way, you can avoid the approaching bus's side mirror. And at the end of your trip, watch out for cyclists. Safe journey from Dublin Bus and Bus Aaron. What is it that makes Moy Park Chicken Kiev's so special? It's because we are very dedicated people. When we started making chicken Kiev's, anyone around here who had a son would call the little fella Kiev. One school class had five lads called Kiev. Turns out they thought it was short for Kievan. I named my firstborn after that. Kievan? 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 Kievan. 
Welcome to Horizon, where one clever box lets you do extraordinary things. Like recording four of your favorite programs while you watch a fifth. It transforms any screen into a TV screen. It even suggests exciting new programs you might like and includes 19 amazing HD channels. This is Horizon, the most extraordinary TV ever, delivered by UPC's Fiber Power Network. Now in a bundle with 120 meg unlimited broadband. UPC, the makers of extraordinary. Welcome back to Nationwide from the Women's Exercise Yard at Kilmainham Jail. Tonight we're remembering the 25,000 women and children who were transported to Australia as convicts in the 18th and 19th centuries. Now Australian artist Christina Henri has spent six years giving names and identities to these forgotten people. But some of those who were sent from Irish ports never made it to Australia, as Niall Martin now reports. This was the last view of Ireland the convicts and crew on board the Neva ever saw. Cove was the main port used for transporting convicts to Australia. Altogether there were 25,566 convict women exiled from England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales and about 25% or around 9,000 of those women were Irish. Aboard one of those ships was my very own female convict ancestor Mary Monk so it's a really really emotional thing for me to be here at this point. This is Elizabeth Fort in Cork City where the female convicts were brought before being evicted from Ireland. Elizabeth Fort was the first Irish convict depot. Um, a convict depot meant it was the place where all of the women who were convicted in the various counties from all over Ireland were assembled here prior to embarking on a transport ship. After they left here, they were taken down to the city quays and steamed down to Cove, where they would join their, their transport ship. The Neva set sail from Cove on January the 8th, 1835. This was the last spot for those women, those thousands of women who left Ireland going to somewhere, the unknown, the ends of the earth. There were 150 convict women on board that ship, the Neva, with their 33 children, some of them babies at arms. But at the same time, the women on board were no angels. They were, after all, convicts. Most of them were, you know, it was their umpteenth conviction for petty theft. You had, in, in the, on the female side, you had quite a lot of prostitutes as well. Um, and you had, in, on, in, in, again, in the case that I studied, there was one person convicted of manslaughter. And there were people who had stolen um, very valuable goods, you know. Some of them were, were very, very cruel people, you know. There's a, a group of con women that I go into in, 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 in the book. They must have taken, you know, everything from a family in Tipperary, you know, and, and seemed to have no, no qualms about doing it, you know. Even though they were sent for maybe typically seven or 14 years, uh, the common estimate by a British historian, I think Shaw is his name, that, that there was only 5% ever came back to the British Isles, you know. So even if you were only sent for seven, in reality, you were going for good, you know. Conditions on board were fairly good, and after a four-month voyage, the Neva approached Australia. She took a shortcut through the Bass Strait, when in the middle of the night, she hit rocks. There are contradictory accounts of, of what happened, um, but it seems the ship hit a reef and broke up. The upper deck collapsed on top of the prison at some stage. Um, the women made many of them into the cuddy, which is a little cabin at the back of the ship, if you like. Uh, as the ship broke up on the reef, that collapsed on top of them, and there were stories of mutilated bodies being washed up on the island for, for, for several weeks later. Um, and obviously many, many children died in, in the wreck as well, you know. Luckily, the current and the wind are drifting them toward King Island. Uh, they're washed up there early in the morning. Um, they are in a very bad condition at that stage. All they can do is stumble into the bush behind the beach and go to sleep. When they wake up, uh, there's seven of them at that stage dead or dying. So there's only 15 left. Uh, they do what they can to find food from, from the, the wreckage. They subsist on shellfish, etc. And after 
perhaps a week. They actually met with the crew of another ship that was wrecked south of their position. That crew directed them to a sealer who was living on the island. He was a European man living with uh, an Aboriginal family. He's able to give them dogs to uh, hunt for wallaby, so the food situation becomes a little bit better. And about six weeks after the wreck occurred, they they rescued when a guy called Charles Friend, who actually owned the, sec the other ship that had been wrecked, was sailing past the island, saw signalling fires, uh, came on the island and discovered that there were actually two ships wrecked there, including one of his own. And he rescued them from the island and brought them to Launceston in Tasmania. There was no reprieve for the fact that they had been wrecked or, you know, shoddily treated or anything else and they served out their time uh, until the, 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 the uh, records lose track of them essentially when they, when they leave the convict system, you know. The story of the loss of 224 lives made few headlines at the time. The lives of the 150 women and 55 children on board forgotten until now. This was 1835. I Irish people, when they heard about it, they didn't hear about it until, you know, more than six months after it happened. When they did hear about it, this was a group of, of prisoners, of convicts, whom they would have considered the lowest strata of their society. They, they died halfway across the world. I think a lot of Irish people probably didn't even know where it was. They were more concerned with their own day-to-day -day existence. And, you know, certainly within 10 years when the famine arrived, they were concerned with survival. <laughs> The bonnets remembering the women and children who left Cove on the Neva will be exhibited at Cove Heritage Centre at the harbour side. I just started in the Cove Heritage Centre as manager a number of weeks ago, uh, but on my first morning uh, we had a large cruise liner uh, parked up outside and within a few moments two people came in and asked to speak to me. Uh, two Australian tourists uh, who had a story to tell. Um, the lady I spoke to was a, a Leone Kelly whose great-great-grandmother at one stage left County Westmead in 1806 um, and had worked her way right through Australia. Both Leone and her cousin decided to make this bonnet in memory of their great-great-grandmother and Leone wanted it back here in Cove where her great-great-grandmother started on her voyage to Australia. So it, it brings full circle, the full story of the girls who left this country and the bonnets and the exhibition which we're now trying to do. It's returning the spirit of the women back to Ireland and you know at a time like this when it's the year of the gathering I think that's so pertinent to be bringing those women's spirit home this year. Of course many of the Irish convicts who were transported to Australia created new crime-free lives for themselves and these days descendants of those reluctant settlers form mainstream Australian society. I'm joined now by Victor Malheim on Skype who's descended from Margaret Drury, one of six convicts who survived the Neva. Victor, hello. Now we're in Kilmainham Jail from where your ancestor Margaret started her journey to Australia. Did you always know about how she survived the Neva? Uh, no. Uh, my brother did tell me back in the beginning of my research that there was a, a female convict called Margaret Jury. Uh, it wasn't until I started researching in 2009 that I, I found Margaret who had survived a shipwreck of King Island. And what are your reflections about Margaret's story? It's a story of survival. It's not only of a shipwreck, it's a story of survival of life. Uh, she, like many other women, survived the imprisonment, a voyage which came to the other end of the world. Again, she survived the shipwreck. And then she had to be imprisoned again for some of her misdemeanours. She also showed a compassionate side of her life with uh, hiding one of her convict friends until the authorities found out. Uh, I don't know what the punishment was for that, but uh, she was caught by the authorities. And turning to your wife now, Jill. Hello, Jill. You made a bonnet in remembrance of Margaret Drury and her story. What are your thoughts and feelings? What do they evoke? When I think about Margaret's story and all of the women who were transported, I'm quite amazed at their resilience and their determination 
not only to survive, but to build a new life and bear and raise children in an alien land. And it's strange to think that without that strength of character, so many of us wouldn't be here and our daughter would not be modelling the bonnet made to commemorate the life of her great-great-great-grandmother, Margaret Drury. Society, or because of poverty or circumstance, were forced to do illegal acts. With a rose across my heart, I'm, not alone. I'm calling it the carpet of bonnets because the women's story was swept under the carpet, and now here in the Kilmainham Jail, we've actually got the bonnets being the carpet, being the story. And I'm so happy to say that it goes through till the middle of December. And so it's time to leave Christina and the volunteers at the reception. Time indeed to leave Kilmainham Jail. I hope you've enjoyed our stories about Ireland's convict past. We've come to the end of Nationwide for this evening. Until our next one, good evening. There's no Nationwide on Monday, but on Wednesday's programme, the remarkable story of the Irishman who is credited with saving the lives of thousands of people in Rome during the Second World War. We find out about the man who became known as the Scarlet Pimpernel. Still to come tonight on RT, one seven ordinary men and women put on the director's hat for Simply Amdram after the break, while in an hour's time Kevin Dundon gets passionate about modern Irish food, putting an Italian twist on buttermilk. Do stay with us. is my assistant and you're watching the Republic of Telly with Bernard and friends. Hey, I'm Jennifer McGuire. Tonight on the Republic of Telly, I do loads of stuff on my new show, Republic of Telly. Oh my, my God. Show. Are you as turned on as me right now, are you? Yeah. The Republic of Telly returns bank holiday Monday at 9.30 on RTE2. I'm going to grow old gracefully. I think I might grow old disgracefully, actually. <laughs> I'd say the older you get, the more happy you are in yourself as a person. I think you can glow from within, and I think certainly the serum just sort of like help. It makes me feel good, and it works. Oh, yeah. <laughs> good loving and good living. It just gives you that natural-looking glow. Once you start getting those second glances, <laughs> you know it's working. <laughs> Supercharge your regime with the right clinically proven number seven serum for your age. Number seven. Ta-da! needs you, Ender. It's Harry Potter meets Star Wars. Five stars. Now! Ender's Game, in cinemas now. Morning, Becky. Officer. Nisha. Little David and Big David. Siobhan. Everyone who scrapes us, spreads us, dunks us, sprinkles us, and ever so carefully, covers us. Thanks for having us around for breakfast. Wake up to Nutella, the hazelnut spread.